Akufo Addo. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you for inviting me once again. You're also the chairman of the Economic Community of West African uh, States. Uh, France and Europe have announced that they would pull out militarily uh, from Mali. Does this create a security vacuum for Mali, for Sahel, and even for countries like yours? Clearly, um, a new security arrangement has to be made in the light of the decision of the European countries led by France to leave the, the, the Malian theater. And we're engaged in those discussions to see uh, what modifications there has to be to the security posture of ECOWAS, as well as of the European forces, because my understanding from the statement that the French president made to us in private as well as publicly is that he, they're relocating their forces to Niger, essentially. And uh, that will therefore have an impact on the, on the overall posture and strategy of the various uh, players. Are you regretting that decision? I cannot regret it. It is the decision of France. Right. The initial decision to come into Mali was made between the, the then Malian government and the then French government. It was a decision that was taken. Uh, and uh, the circumstances in Mali are what have made it difficult for the French to continue to be there. We have to make new, new arrangements, that's all. Right. Uh, one of the reasons invoked uh, was uh, the arrival of Russian mercenaries, the Wagner group. The French president says they're up to 800. Is this also a red line for you? I'm not quite sure that that is one of the reasons why they... I, well, I, my is... understanding is that it is the absence of cooperation right. between the French forces and the Malian government right. that is at the heart of this decision. I'm not sure that the presence of these mercenaries, alleged mercenaries, is a reason for them to cop out. I don't understand. But is it a reason for you to worry, Mr. President? Everybody's worried. We have, we have a, 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 a long-standing protocol within ECOWAS, within the AU, against foreign mercenaries intervening in the lives of our various states. So if there's a mercenary force involved in the life of Mali, it's a matter that concerns us. We, if you know the history of our continent, which I'm sure you do very well, you will know the role that foreign mercenaries have played in our history, and it has not been a positive one. So, so they should have, leave? Obviously, we would, prefer that we would prefer to be dealing with, with the Malian state and the Malian government. Dealing with the Malian state and government has been a problem uh, for ECOWAS. I know you've been very uh, involved. One of the uh, main bones of contentions is the timetable for elections. Uh, there is a new proposal by Algeria of a 16-month transition. The Junta had said they want four years. Is there a realistic solution on the horizon? We're seeing. Well, I mean, in, in these matters, the door is never closed to talk and to negotiation. But are they going on, those negotiations? There are, they are, they are, they are contacts and dialogue going on. But the key is that, as far as we're concerned, there was an agreement between ECOWAS and the transitional authorities at the beginning in August 2020, which brought the transition to come to an end in February this year, at the end of this month. At the last minute, we heard from the, the new junta in Mali that they no longer were in a position to honor that pledge, but that they were proposing a, a, a situation for four or five years in office. Some of us were aghast at this. I'm an elected president in Ghana. I have four years in office. And for an, Ill, an, an unelected, illegitimate regime to want to be in office with the consent of ECOWAS for five, six years sounded to, to us outrageous. And that is why the proposal was rejected. We are, we are determined to work towards a more acceptable solution. What is a more acceptable? 12 months, 18 months? We'll see. I mean, it depends on what, what is put on the table. But uh, clearly, the original the proposal that is now work, being put on the table by the Malian authorities is clearly unacceptable. Less than a year would be I, my My own feeling from talking to my peers is that a 12-month period it would be an acceptable framework. But that is, I mean, you hear from my mouth, it's not that it is ECOWAS policy. We need to engage and sit down and then find out how that can work out. Obviously, there is also Burkina Faso. ECOWAS sent a delegation there. They seem to be more upbeat 
uh, in terms of what the intentions of the junta there is, are you also more optimistic that uh, the so Mali far, scenario will not repeat itself? So far, the, the, the signals and the words that are coming out of Ouagadougou under the new military authority there are, uh, if you like, more encouraging. Um, and we're, we're, we're seeing to what extent. But they've, they've moved very quickly. They've put in, into being a, a technical committee on their side to make proposals to the junta about the timetable for the transition. And the imp impression that has been given is that they're in a hurry to put in uh, an acceptable transitional framework. We're, we're, 18 months, like was originally done for Mali, we'll is we'll realistic, see. or do you fear that? We'll see. We'll see. We'll see what. We'll see what. We'll, we'll see what comes. At the end of the day, our position is very simple. It is up to the military authorities to find an accommodation with ECOWAS on a program that is acceptable to ECOWAS, and that is the position that we, we will stand. Six months, nine months, twelve months, whatever be the case, it has to be. But no more. It has to be a period. Yes, we do. we're not interested in returning West Africa to the days of military rule. Well, we want to move away from it. Yes, that. but you're moving back to it. Uh, let's take the example of Guinea, where nearly six months after the coup, the Colonel Dumbuya has not given any timetable. I mean, so, are you concerned that the clock is ticking? Of course, we're concerned. We've said so. All our public statements have indicated... More the, sanctions on the horizon? We'll see. We'll see. But our we have indicated that we are very concerned about the absence of a clear uh, timetable for the restoration of the democratic rule in When Guinea. should they provide such Where, a... Any time from now, as soon as possible. We, 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 uh, the, the engagement is a constant one. Right. Uh, I mean, we've seen uh, this epidemic of coups in, in West Africa. This must worry you because uh, the coups are quite popular, it seems, with uh, the... I don't understand where you, you get uh, a few people in the, in the capital. More than a region. few, Mr. President, well, it seems. I don't know. That the, the, the information we get is also quite... It's, it's quite this is why it is better to have uh, 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 systems of government where popularity is easily determined. But are you worried about, that of coups have been become the norm now in recent It's not months. the norm. It's not the norm. It's happened in three... The trend, out, let's put it this been, way. It's, I'm not sure you, we can call it a trend. It's been in three states out of the 15 states of ECOWAS so far. Obviously, we do not want this contagion to spread, and we're going to work towards making sure that it doesn't spread. We work with it domestically to provide good governance for our people, so to take away the basis for any pretext at intervention, and, uh, and, 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 and at the same time insist on adherence to our own protocols. We have a protocol that binds all of us uh, on, on good governance and democracy in the region. We're determined to work towards Is that. Is this a mortal danger for the region? I don't understand the concept of mortal danger <laughs> when you're dealing with sta states and communities and, and state functions. Uh, all kinds of evolutions happen. But it is something that is definitely not welcome when we are going to do our best to make sure that it doesn't repeat itself and, if possible, it is reversed. Nigeria has said that the issue of uh, term mandates, uh, like, you know, having this third mandate, is a problem and that it is sowing the seeds of such uh, coups. We've seen it in Guinea. I mean, the third term of Alpha Conde <laughs> was the reason uh, for, for the coup. Are you concerned that... I'm not uh, quite sure. Have they, is that what Colonel Dumbuya said? He hasn't said that. These are speculations by people like you. But should ECOWAS be more... Uh... I believe that, I believe that uh, ECOWAS is concerned. We have already indicated to the world that we are in the process of reviewing and having a look at our, our basic protocols in the light of the developments that have taken place. And I think it's a matter of concern. I, for instance, I'm, I'm concerned about it. I think, for, fortunately for me, the matter has been clearly uh, determined by both practice and by, and by principle. In Ghana, you have two terms, if you're lucky. Uh, as, as, <laughs> as you have been. Yes, you have two terms, and that's that. And uh, I, I believe that that is a good model for the rest of our, of our sister states. Just as a conclusion, uh, are, are, are you concerned that uh, coups, destabilization could happen in, in Ghana, or do you believe that uh, the state is solid on security and democratic grounds. We were here when we saw what happened in America on the 6th of January. 
when there was an attempt in a country which had 200 uninterrupted years of democratic government, when people staged what appears to have been an attempt at an insurrection in America. So the issue of stability in every state is a constant matter. That is what the, the, the adage. On this panel, His Excellency Cyril Ramaphosa, President of the Republic of South Africa. His Excellency Paul Kagame, President of the Republic of Rwanda. His Excellency Nana Akufo Addo, President of the Republic of Ghana. His Excellency Prime Minister Carlos Agostino do Rosario, representing His Excellency Felipe Inyusi, President of the Republic of of Mozambique. And with us is the Premier of Hauteng Province in the audience, Honorable David Makura. All protocols observed. Excellencies, this is a specially curated event that brings together several global and regional investors who are active on our continent. This is also a platform that allows your excellencies to do several things. Use this opportunity to pitch your investment needs and opportunities. Set the stage for conversations that will be held later on in boardroom sessions over the next three days. And more importantly, an opportunity for you to own the narrative around the opportunities your respective countries do provide. So I'll go ahead. This is a conversation, and it's a conversation between yourselves and investors from around the globe and our region. But I'll kick off our session with the first opportunity and pitch. Your Excellencies, every single one of you have been in the news recently for all the good reasons. So I say congratulations to you on the excellent work that you're doing, your vision and your leadership in leading our continent. And I think, ladies and gentlemen, you, it'll be quite appropriate to give our Excellencies a warm round of applause. I'm going to take my seat in just a moment, but my first question to you, and I'm going to start with President Ramaphosa first. Why is it that investors in this room should pay attention and recognize your GPS coordinates here in South Africa as the place to do business in the region? Over to you, Mr. President. Well, thank you very much. We welcome this opportunity, and I think I speak on behalf of my brothers here. This uh, forum has become a marketplace for attracting investment to our great continent. And obviously, as we sit here, we will talk about our own countries. But more broadly, we want to have a broader continental look because Africa's time has come for investments. And we want serious investors who will look at the whole continent and particularize it and look at various countries for investment opportunities, and we've got great ones. For South Africa, we've got uh, a very uh, attractive investment uh, opportunities in a number of sectors, and right now we're focusing on areas like infrastructure, uh, on energy, on the manufacturing uh, base that we have in our country, and seeking to industrialize more and more in areas like automotive, agro-processing, and energy, uh, implements. So those are areas that we, we, we're focusing on that we believe can attract a whole lot of investments and they do mutate into a number of other subsectors. We believe that we are the tourism uh, capital of our continent. Uh, when God created Africa, he spent quite a lot of time on South Africa uh, <laughs> to make South Africa as attractive as it is. When you come in right from the bottom, you see Table Mountain, and once you do so, even as you want to travel through the whole continent, which you must, uh, you'll find that you want to spend a little bit more time in South Africa. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> Thank you very much, President Ramaphosa. And we'll go on next to President Kagame. Over to you, sir. Well, thank you. Uh, 
I think building on what uh, President Ramaphosa has just mentioned, uh, when you look at uh, Africa as a whole, there is uh, a lot of progress, a lot of uh, activities taking place that are really raising uh, Africa to a much higher level. I, I want to simply say I have always thought it was Africa's time. I think we, 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 only, we Africans have let ourselves down and we, we are now, I think, uh, realizing that uh, it has always been our time and we need to seize every opportunity and be where we should be by now. So for, first of all, I also want to thank uh, President Ramaphosa, the President of South Africa and uh, the government and the private sector for providing a very uh, good environment for us to be here to discuss these issues and thank the president of the African Development Bank uh, that has put uh, all this together with the, the South African leadership. For Rwanda, particularly, we have concentrated on uh, creating a conducive business environment uh, for people to invest, to do business in Rwanda with the environment of predictable governance systems and security and uh, uh, so far so good uh, in a region of this African community that uh, is probably the fastest growing region on our continent and Rwanda being part of that and benefiting from uh, that as well. And Rwanda being uh, the second uh, in the ranking for, in Africa uh, for the ease of doing business. The World Bank ranking puts uh, Rwanda number two. I think we have held that position for quite some time. It's high time we became number one, so we are working <laughs> So we continue to do that. Uh, so we, we need to create that environment for people to come and invest, and uh, it's in the area. Three things I would want to mention, but they are probably 15. I'll just uh, be very brief. We have created uh, a number of things. One, we have... Uh, uh, agri-business hub we have created uh, between 15 and 20,000 hectares that we are trying to put under irrigation and partner with the private sector for uh, agribusiness and exports around that. That one we expect to have uh, a public-private partnership uh, second, we have also created uh, Kigali Innovation City, uh, where uh, technology companies and high institutions of learning uh, come together with uh, financial services uh, to allow uh, the startup companies to develop and grow and. Uh, so we expect uh, private uh, capital to come in and uh, grow that. The last one, not last but not least, uh, of the three is the Kigali Innovation Fund, which we have created. And uh, with the support of the African Development Bank, we have already put in money, and government is putting money. We want private people to come and uh, invest as well to help uh, these startups that are, are growing. So you're most welcome. I, I, I reserved the beauty part for another discussion. <laughs> <laughs> because... Uh, well, uh, President sorry. Kagami, I'm going to say that was um, an excellent pitch for Rwanda there. Um, I know that um, President Akufuado is chomping at the bit to top uh, Rwanda in this regard. So President Akufuado, over to you. First of all, I want to, to thank uh, President Abyssin and the President of the African Development Bank for this second opportunity, this the second invitation that uh, uh, you've given me, given me to attend this uh, 
this forum. I was here last year and he's found it possible to renew the invitation. I'm grateful to him. And equally grateful, of course, to the world champion, the rugby world champion. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> And President Cyril Matamela Ramaphosa for the, the warmth and the hospitality that we always get when we come here. Very grateful for that. I think that the, I have a, a very big responsibility. I'm the sole West African here, so I have also to bat for West Africa a little bit. We have Southern Africa. <laughs> but um, the, the, the Ghanaian perspective, I think two things. First of all, I want very much to endorse what President Ramaphosa said, the need for us to have a continental framework in the way in which we're talking about economies in West Africa, in, in Africa. Um, the African continental free trade area is a major step forward for us, and we have found the overwhelming majority, I think, press unanimity on the continent in adhering to its term. Ghana has been privileged to be chosen as the host of its secretariat, and all the initiatives are onward going to make sure that by the target date, the, 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 the tra free trade area becomes a reality. And when it does so, it changes so many of the dynamics of the economics of our, of our, of our, of our situation. So I think it's extremely important when we're having this kind of meeting that we have very much this immediate future in mind when our economies hopefully are going to be locked into a common market uh, with all the, the commonalities that that involves for the development of Africa. This, the specific Ghanaian context, what we've been doing since I came into office nearly three years ago is to strengthen the macroeconomy of our country. We inherited a situation and a large fiscal deficit that has been turned around now, considerable imbalances in the way in which our economy was being run, and that has also been turned around. A 15, 16% rate of inflation is today at 7%, the lowest in two decades in, in, in the management of our national economy. And these are the building blocks for us. The macro economy we think is extremely important that we maintain discipline in the way in which we manage our public finances. And that has been our major objective. And so far so good, we're realizing and we're resisting the temptation in an election year which is about to go to t turn on the tap. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hoping that the work we have done will take us through without having to do that. But. Um, the, so that's one uh, very important background to the, the development of the Ghana. And the rest of it, and the, the, the consequences of it, of course, has been that in these three years, we've had one of the fastest growing economies, not just on the continent, but in the world, 8%, 7%, 7, this year we're looking at a 7.6% growth. And it's been consistent over these last three years. So you have an expanding economy that, of course, presents opportunities, especially in three key areas. Our infrastructure, uh, it's, a, it's a common problem across the continent, but uh, it's one which we're paying a great deal of attention to, the development of our road, our rails, and our airport infrastructure in the country. In fact, last year here, uh, an important initiative that we launched last year, which is bearing fruit, is the Accra SkyTrain project, in which South African investors are taking a very keen interest. And we're hoping that we'll be able to, to advance the, the whole concept even more strongly this, this year. So we have that. We have also the transformation of our agriculture. It doesn't make sense that on this continent we keep still being a net importer of food when we have everything that is there to be able to grow food for ourselves. Our land, we have our, the, the, the greatest proportion of the arable lands of the world are in Africa. Ghana has a very high proportion of that. We have waters that are running through our system and capable of being the fountain of irrigation. So we're also paying a great deal of attention to the modernization of our agriculture. We have a program which we've called Planting for Food and Jobs. That is proving to be, and I want to be modest in saying so, but it's proving to be a spectacular success in Ghana. First of all, in the way in which it's addressing foodstuffs, we're now for the first time in over a decade 
exporting foodstuffs to our neighbors. Generally, there's a big thrust of the, uh, the development of our economy that very, very keen in developing private sector interests. Because as you know, Ghanaian agriculture is largely smallholder agriculture. But then there is also the opportunity for large commercial agriculture to coexist side by side with the, with the smallhold of the farmers who are looking for investments in that area. And the third is we've established a Ghana Infrastructure Investment Fund. And we are looking for money uh, from outside also to invest in the fund. It becomes a major uh, leverage for us for attracting monies to deal with our infrastructure. So we have a broad range. Our country, as all you know, the country that used to be known as the Gold Coast, we have a lot of important minerals in our country. And we're looking to see how we can bring value to, to those imports, not to, uh, to those uh, resources, not just the export of them in their raw form, but enhancing their, their, their take in the value chain. I'm, I'm speaking about gold, I'm speaking about manganese, I'm speaking of considerable bauxite resources, iron ore resources, lithium, which is now coming into play as a major uh, uh, natural resource. All of these are in abundance in Ghana, and we're now trying to forge the policies that will make it possible for these also to be the subject of, uh, of, uh, of investment. I, like the President of Rwanda, will leave out the beauty and the warmth of the Ghanaian people in my presentation. <laughs> thank you very much indeed. Well, President Akufuado, thank you very much. We hear foundation, priorities, preparation, opportunity all bundled into one. And we do know that um, there's a very strong likelihood <coughs> that all three of your excellencies will be topped by His Excellency the Prime Minister, Carlos Agostino de Rosario, for your uh, pitch here. Thank you morning. so much. Allow me to respond in, in Portuguese. I don't know whether this condition has been created for that. Uh, first of all, muito obrigado por é uma grande honra para mim estar aqui a representar o meu presidente, Presidente News. E ele não pode estar aqui por razões da agenda nacional. Queria primeiro felicitar o, o BAD, o seu presidente da Dezina, por ter criado essas condições para que essa iniciativa de juntar nesse espaço investidores, facilitadores como o BAD e os governos que são promotores nesse espaço para que a África tenha projetos. A África tem mudado bastante da sua imagem. E Moçambique também acompanha essas mudanças. E nós oferecemos muita coisa para o capital estrangeiro e para o investimento, quer doméstico, quer aquele estrangeiro. Nós temos no nosso país a liderança. Liderança que está neste momento cometido com a paz. E a paz é um pré-requisito fundamental para que os investimentos possam correr. Está também muito cometido com os processos de transparência, de mudança da legislação, para que haja o combate à corrupção. O nosso país tem feito muitas reformas e tem tido muito trabalho para que possamos trazer a inflação a níveis controláveis. E esse é o resultado da liderança do nosso Presidente. Perante momentos conturbados, há três anos atrás, que nós temos a inflação controlada. Saímos de uma inflação de 26% em 2016 para os atuais 2%, 3% de inflação. Portanto, nós temos uma inflação controlada que é bom para os investidores. Também temos essa liderança que se traduz em muitos recursos. E os recursos são recursos humanos, que são população jovem. Nós temos 29 milhões de, 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 de população, dos quais 75% são jovens. E esses jovens estão sendo, neste momento, treinados, capacitados para poderem competir no mercado, através de capacitação profissional, técnico profissional. O nosso país também tem recursos naturais. E eu acredito que, neste, nesta plataforma, o gás natural, o projeto do gás no Rovuma, 
é o maior projeto em termos de financiamento que esta plataforma vai, vai, vai ter que estudar e debater. E nós oferecemos essa plataforma, mas queremos que esse gasto seja feito na perspectiva de, por um lado, não prejudicar setores não petrolíferos. Portanto, agricultura, turismo, infraestruturas, energia, estes setores devem caminhar, devem ser capacitados por gás. O gás não pode prejudicar o desenvolvimento desses, desses, desses setores. Queremos uma economia muito diversificada, por um lado. E é por isso que nós também acreditamos que essa exploração do gás também se faça em termos de sustentáveis do ponto de vista do ambiente. Não pode, de fato, estarmos a fazermos o gás e a perigar o ambiente. Portanto, fazemos de modo diversificado, mas também, digamos, dentro dos parâmetros internacionais de conservação e proteção do ambiente. Estamos também cometidos com reformas. Reformas de simplificação de procedimentos para investidores, reformas dos vistos. Hoje em dia, em Moçambique, é possível ter o visto na fronteira. Estamos a criar condições para o visto online e também queremos agora juntar-nos aos procedimentos de nossa localização geográfica. Nós estamos bem localizados, de forma que somos facilitadores do comércio interno e, e externo. Somos a ligação entre nós e os países da Interlente. Thank you very much, Prime Minister Rosario. Greatly appreciated. Again, another excellent pitch. We've discussed everything here from agriculture, tourism, industry, innovation, um, wonderful opportunities. I'm sure our excellencies have whetted your appetite. So we're going to turn it over to you, our global and regional investors. We do have microphones on the sides of the hall. Uh, we, at this point, due to the limitations of time, only have an opportunity to address one question each to each other president. So as a matter of courtesy, I'm just going to ask if the person before you has addressed their question to a specific uh, president on the panel, please extend the next question to another member of the panel in order to provide equal opportunity. I see a hand raised right in front of me over here, but I'm going to start with the lady right in front of me. If you could um, introduce yourself and ask your question, kindly keep all questions short for reasons of time. Good morning. Questions, not comments. Thank you very much. Hello. You're on. Good morning. My name is Leila Bouamatou. I am the first CEO woman uh, of an African investment bank in Mauritania. And uh, my question is for our president, addressed to President Kagame, uh, potential, Africa's potential access to foreign investment is, uh, is hampered by the unstable macroeconomic policies, lack of trans transparency regarding, in, in, like regarding political um, environment, and lack of good governance. According to your successful experience and the successful story of your country, what advice are you going, can you give us as foreign investors Thank you very much. We'll take, the, we'll take the questions very quickly and then come uh, to the panel. So we'll take the next question. Yes, sir. Good morning, Your Excellencies. My name is Abdul Samad Rabiu, Chairman Boa Group from Nigeria. And my question goes to the uh, President of South Africa. You know, uh, Your Excellency, you've said it all about the beauty of South Africa. And as you all know, South Africa is one of the most beautiful countries. In Africa. I didn't, I didn't hear that. <laughs> I will repeat, it's one of the most beautiful, if not the most beautiful country in Africa. And, let's uh, let's, let's kind Africans. of keep the questions yes. short, so, short, please. My Excellency, Your Excellency, my question is, you know, as investors, you know, that are trying to invest all over Africa, we have this unfortunate incident of xenophobia. What are you doing to firmly address the issue of xenophobia here in South Africa? Because if investors are coming, they must feel, you know, embraced and welcomed. So what are you doing to firmly address this very ugly incident, Your Excellency? Thank you. Thank you. We'll take another question. Um, any other hands raised? Uh, the hand to the right, and then we'll come to the gentleman <coughs> in the middle, and that will be the, those will be the two last questions. Uh, good morning, 
Your Excellencies, my name is Ade Adefeko. I'm Vice President of Olam Agribusiness Company, which is in 25 countries in Africa. A quick question to Mrs. President Kagame and President Ramaphosa. No, it's no, two no, in one no, because no, it's connected. No, Ade, please, we will follow protocol. Um, we did say we'll give each of the presidents one opportunity to respond to a question. So please ask the question um, of either of the presidents who haven't been given an opportunity. All right, at this point in time, then I will go to the president of Rwanda. Your Excellency, president of Rwanda. No. <laughs> president Kagame has already received a question. Please, President Akufo and Prime Minister Rosario is right over right. here. Thank you. All right, I'll speak in Portuguese at this point and I'll address it to the President Rosario. Uh, Bom dia. Chamo me a de Suda, Nigeria. Es muy importante por la. Es. O que es que es que es que es que es Investitura, agricultura en Mozambique. ¿Cuál es el... Todos, dicen, 25 países en África. ¿Cuál es el seu investitar para... para nosotros todos, para investitar a Mozambique? Sobre agricultura. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I do trust that the last question um, will be going to His Excellency President Akufuado. Thank you. Yes, the lady with the hat raised. Yes, thank you. Good morning. My name is Dr. Tony Luck. I've just become a citizen of Ghana, so I'm very happy to say to my. Yes, Mr. President, South Africa, you left me. <laughs> I wanted to know, um, for all of us, what was the courage and intention that you had when you decided to change the way in which the cocoa would be handled? Because I think that that helps all of us understand how we will integrate into the global market if African presidents get the courage and the intention to use a very important word, which is no. We will do it a different way. Thank you very much, Dr. Locke. So, Your Excellencies, in the order that the questions have been asked, we turn the microphones back over to you. So, we'll start with President Kagame first, and then come over to President Ramaphosa, Prime Minister Rosario, and then finally, but not the least, President Akufuado. Thank you very much, Excellencies. Well, let me start by saying that uh, to the good question raised, the issues we have to deal with in Africa uh, in order for us to attract investments, have uh, business uh, environment uh, attractive and, and therefore grow and you know, develop and be where our countries want to be. Uh, there are these issues of governance that we know have to be considered and, in fact, invested in as well, at least in terms of effort that uh, such happens in our countries. Then issues of stability, uh, whether it is political or other issues that uh, affect our, st our stability when you have conflicts, you have security issues we have seen. So there is nothing new uh, that uh, we don't know we have to deal with. I think all of us know what issues we have to deal with. The main difference will come when, uh, in one place or another, they are actually doing what they know they ought to do. Uh, it's not just knowing what you ought to do or what you are even capable of doing, uh, but it's another in actual fact, doing it. So when we have seen across Africa uh, progress uh, happening, in, and, and there are many positive things happening in every country of our continent. Uh, so they, they, they are not happening by miracle or, or anything. It's, it's just because people are getting to doing what they have to do and have known they have to do for a long time. 
So the, the advice, therefore, is, is simple. Let's do what we know we ought to do. Let's involve our women. We see more numbers of women becoming CEOs because there are many who are capable, so we should not leave our women behind. That's what we have tried to address. We know we have to have uh, accountable, transparent uh, systems of government, and we have to make sure we do that. We have to create uh, rule of law in our environment for people to expect certain things to happen, and they, that's what happens in any country. So that, that is the main advice. I, I cannot give advice of things that I, I think that anyone doesn't know in this room. Everyone knows what we are talking about. Okay. Let's just do it. OK. <laughs> President Kagame. Uh, that's a plug for Nike there. Just do it. Um, an excellent exhortation there. President Ramaphosa. Thank you very much. The issue that has been raised, um, it falls in the category of the whole global challenge that many countries are facing, which is the issue of migration. How people move from one country to another, and some move because of economic conditions and political conditions and all that. And South Africa has always welcomed people from many other parts of the world. And in fact, right now we are one of the big recipients of people who have migrated to our country, fleeing their various countries for a number of reasons. And uh, our neighbors who have gone through challenges, we've seen them, uh, their people coming into South Africa. And in the main, they have settled here, we're very different from a number of other countries in that we decided not to set up what you would call reception centers where people would be kept in camps. We consciously decided that we want people who come to our country to be integrated into the South African society and be part of it, to be able also to make a living and to be part of the broader South African society. And some have criticized us for that and said, you should have set up camps, but we, we, we've resisted doing that. But as we all know, when a country goes through difficult economic conditions itself, citizens of the country have a sense of proprietary. They have a sense of self-interest, and they want to protect their own self-interest. It happens all over the world. And I characterize it as a fault line. Migration issues become a fault line in the life of any country. And sometimes reaction is sparked off by what you would call nonsensical incidents, uh, whether somebody greeted another one in a different language or whether they couldn't answer in a different language and it just sparks off. Inherently, South Africans are not xenophobic. The government of South Africa is irrevocably committed against xenophobia. We abhor it, we've got policies that are aimed at, uh, at uh, diluting it and uh, taking action against it, and uh, attacks on people from other countries are seen as a criminal act. In the recent past, of course, the unfortunate thing is that a number of people died, and many of them were South Africans who got caught up in the whole fracas that happened in a number of areas. And then the, when things like this happen, the criminal element kicks in. And people start seeing opportunities uh, to, to, to act in, an, in a very incorrect way. Now, the problem that often happens with all this is that fake news becomes the order of the day. And in our situation, much of what happened was then fueled by fake news. And uh, some of it happened in such a very ugly and gross way, where people were seen, there was pictures that were sent around, people jumping out of buildings that were burning. And they said, this is what is happening in South Africa. And it wasn't. It was people burning, jumping out of a building which was you know, accidentally on fire in another country. And they transposed it and said, this is what is happening in South Africa which then fueled the reaction of people in other countries, in Nigeria, for instance. And at the time as it happened, I was in close contact with President Buhari. 
and uh, the people, uh, the, the security forces in Nigeria, you know, took a firm stance to, to help and defend South Africans who were there and their businesses. And similarly, we then took action here. Two, more than 200 people were arrested because we also needed to demonstrate our firmness in taking action against those who were acting against people from, from other countries. And things have settled down. And I was very pleased that President Buhari did not cancel his trip, state visit to South Africa in the wake of what happened. He still came, we sat down and discussed it uh, in, a, in a very uh, pleasant manner, friendly manner, and we decided that we are going to set up an early warning uh, mechanism that will give us early indications of anything that, that could go wrong. But in addition to that, I then sent a number of envoys to various countries. They went to, to, to uh, uh, see President Kagame, uh, President uh, uh, Kufo, uh, Nana Akufo in, uh, in, in Ado in um, uh, Ghana, and they're also going to go now, now in a few days to Mozambique. They're still going around. Uh, just to explain exactly what has happened, but more than that, uh, without taking too much time, we decided that we are going to set up a fact-finding uh, team, which consists of former President Chisano of Mozambique, and former president of Tanzania, Kikwete, they will work with a number of other local South Africans to get to the bottom of this, because we want to prevent further incidents of all this. Clearly, as a nation, we've got to take steps to ensure that South Africans have a greater appreciation of people from other countries, uh, that we are not an island, and uh, being the country that we are, we were also supported by, in our struggle by other countries on the continent who welcomed us with open arms. And as South Africans, we need to have that level of acceptance, level of embrace to other people. So we are irrevocably committed uh, to, to taking action against xenophobic attacks against others. But we would also say we want to work with the continent. We want to work with uh, the whole world. And indeed, we're also working with the UN uh, Commission on Refugees. And they have applauded the policies that we have embraced when it comes to treating refugees. So we want to say once again, South Africa is home to all. We want people to feel comfortable and safe in being in South Africa. And of course, there's got to be processes that uh, have to deal with being uh, regularized to be in South Africa, uh, being permitted to have the necessary permits and all that, which happens in any other country. But South Africa, one, is not xenophobic. Two, South Africa uh, is open to other people from other countries. And we want people to have a sense that this, too, is their home away from home. Thank you very much. President Ramaphosa, I just want to say thank you very much for dealing factually and very sensitively with an issue that has become very thorny on our continent, particularly as we stand on the cusp of operationalizing the African Continental Free Trade Zone. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Again, could we kind of give President Ramaphosa a warm round of applause? Thank you, sir. Prime Minister Rosario. Yes. As I told you initially, Agriculture in our country is, is, a, is a vital for job creation and the income generation. We are, that's why I said that he, in spite we have uh, endowed in, uh, with natural resources such as uh, LNG, we don't need that LNG can be developed in jeopardizing agriculture and in other sectors that are job creations. We have in Mozambique. Uh, about 3 million hectares, but only 10% of what we 10% has been utilized. So we have um, plenty of scopes to, to, to be there. Crops like maize, uh, uh, cashnet, uh, uh, cotton, so which we're bringing here, some project on, the, on this, are there to be. We are now looking for modernization of our agriculture, which, which is uh, very, very crucial. And now, the land is there, 
has been given as a leasing base. We are not selling the land in Mozambique. It's a concession of uh, about 50, 50 years renewable, depending on how you're using the land. So come to Mozambique, the land is there. Two conditions are there. We have been working hard so that peace can prevail, number one. And then, as I said, the inflation is also under control. During the past last three years, we have been controlling the inflation. We brought inflation from 26% for now 3%, which is an amazing effort we did. But peace, macroeconomic stability, and the lead availability are there. Please come to Mozambique. Well, you've, you've heard it consistently from Prime Minister Rosario. His message has been, he's, he's focused on three messages. Agriculture, agriculture, and agriculture. So you heard it from His Excellency. Well, last but not the least, President Akufo Addo. Over to you, sir. First of all, uh, let me thank uh, the new citizen, the new Ghanaian citizen for the question. And um, I'm, I'm thinking that you're part of those who we are granting citizenship for the year of return. Uh, there's a whole big ceremony that I'm uh, due to superintend when I get back home, where so many of our kith and kin from the Americas and the Caribbean are coming to be citizens of Ghana. So you're very welcome, and thank you for the question. I think that the question goes, is a sort of a microcosm of the, of the, of the challenge that we're facing on the continent. And um, why do I say so? Between Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire, we're responsible for 65% of the world's output of cocoa. The cocoa industry, and chocolate and all the related parts, is a uh, hundred billion plus United States dollar industry, well, the global industry, a value chain that produces some 100 billion dollars plus. Out of that, the farmers whose hard work and toil is responsible for the cocoa, the 65%, get six billion plus maximum for their effort. You look at those facts and you know that there's something seriously wrong with that arithmetic. So uh, when I came into office, I, I began to speak about it. And very fortunately for me uh, and for our two countries, the Ivorian leader, Lassan Ouattara, had the same point of view as myself. We found that we had a joint uh, mutual assessment of what was the reality and the need for us to do something about the reality. I see that is the most important aspect of political office, the, the, the opportunity it gives to you to address fundamental issues of confronting your people. So as a result of talks in Abidjan and in Accra, we came to a mutual understanding of what we needed to do, which was to fuse the marketing, the production and marketing policies of our two countries. Uh, the Cocoa Marketing Bo uh, Cocoa Board is the main instrument, state instrument for the development of the cocoa, and they have a Conseil de Cacao Café in Côte d'Ivoire, which is, plays an equivalent role there. So it is a question of bringing the two groups together to forge a common policy, and they have done so, insisting that in future we would ins enter the market uh, at a certain basic floor price and hold, or hold that price, and then, out of it, find the opportunity to increase the earnings of our farmers. So that floor price has been stated. We've gone into the market on that basis. We now have the opportunity to pay our farmers a $400, if you like, bonus, 
which we call the living income differential per ton, and enhancing the, 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 the incomes of our cocoa farmers so that they get more out of this value, this $100 billion industry that they've been given before. And we also found tremendous support from the African Development Bank, which is, is indicated and has as part of the agreements that we're going to sign here, that they are prepared to support us enhancing our infrastructure in the cocoa industry, being able to have a greater capacity for warehousing, being able to do more processing in our country of the, of the raw material, and therefore being able to participate at the higher and higher level of the value chain in the cocoa industry. And the end result of all of this is going to be a considerable enhancement of the incomes of our cocoa farmers. Unfortunately, I think that um, the more progressive elements of the world industry have seen the value of the policy. Mars, the United States company, which is one of the biggest players in the industry, has come out openly to support the policy that uh, the Ghana and Côte d'Ivoire have evolved together, to say that it is the way to ensure a sustainable industry. So, um, like everything in history, I mean, there's a combination of, of luck, of uh, the, the time was ripe, uh, the circumstances were there, and I found um, uh, an interlocutor who shared the same vision as myself, so it was easy for us to work together towards this common goal. He's, in fact, the bigger producer. He's the number one producer. Cote d'Ivoire is the number one producer. We are the second. But between us, we come to this figure of 65%. So it, is, it has been a development that has been, uh, I believe, very, very positive for our two countries. And I, I, I think that uh, it, it, it means that we're capable of duplicating this kind of thinking on a broad range of things that we need to do on the continent. But this is the origin of the policy, and this is where we're going, and we're hoping that um, uh, it, it, it's, it was going to, with the support, as I say, that the ADB is giving us, be able to give us a really strong future position as the industry grows. Thank you. President Akufuado, thank you very much for sharing your thoughts on charting new and strategic pathways for agriculture, not just in Ghana, but also within the region. I'd like to use this opportunity to say a very profound and sincere thank you to our distinguished panel of heads of state and government for enriching our conversation today. But more importantly, in your respective and very unique ways for continuing to own and to shape the narrative on the new Africa, the Africa of our dreams, the Africa that we've all looked forward to. Ladies and gentlemen, kindly give our distinguished panel a final but really warm and robust applause. Um, I hope that the comments I'm about to make will not offend the questioner too much and some people around here. I think there is a fundamental misstatement of the issue in the question. We can no longer continue to make policy for ourselves, in our country, in our region, in our continent, on the basis of whatever support the Western world or France or the European Union can give us. It will not work. It has not worked and it will not work. Our responsibility is to charter a path which is about how we can develop our nations ourselves. It is not right for a country like Ghana, 60 years after independence, to still have its health and education budgets being financed on the basis of the generosity and charity of European taxpayers. By now, we should be able to finance our basic needs ourselves. And if we are going to look at the next 60 years, as a period of transition, a period whereby we can stand on our own feet, our perspective has not to be what the French taxpayer
decides to do with whatever surpluses that they have in France. They're welcome. They are appreciated. Whatever interventions that the French taxpayer through their governments make to us are appreciated. We're not going to lick a gift horse in the mouth. But this continent, with all that has happened, is still today the repository of at least 30% of the most important minerals of the world. It is a, it's a continent of vast arable and fertile land. It has the youngest population of any of the continents in the world. So it has the energy and the dynamism. We have seen it. These um, uh, young men who are showing so much resilience and, 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 and in, uh, ingenuity in crossing the Sahara, finding ways to go across with rickety boats across the Mediterranean to really, those energies, we want to have those energies working inside our country. And we're going to have those energies working in our countries if we begin to build systems that tell the young people of our country that their hopes, their opportunity are right here with us. Migration and the movement of people is being presented in a manner which suggests that somehow it's a new phenomenon. There's nothing new about it. It's as old as man, the movement of people. And it has always been linked to the same thing. The failure of where you are to provide you with an opportunity. So you move somewhere else. Those of you who are familiar with 19th century European history would know that the biggest wave of immigration in, the 19th, in 19th century Europe, the latter part of it, came from Ireland and from Italy. Waves upon waves, generations of Italians and the Irish people left their countries to seek the American paradise, largely because Ireland was not working, Italy was not working. Today, you don't hear it. Italian young people are in Italy. Irish young people are in Ireland. We want young Africans to stay in Africa. And how are they... And it means that we have to get away from this mindset of dependence, this mindset about what can France do for us. France will do whatever it needs to do for its own sake. And when those coincide with us, tant mieux, as the French people say. But our main responsibility as leaders, as citizens, is what we need to do to grow our own countries. What are the institutions that work that will allow us to have good governance? to have accountable governance, to make sure that the monies that are placed at the disposal of leaders are used for the interests of the state and not for those of the leaders, to have systems that allow for accountability, that allow for diversity, that allow for people to be able to express themselves and contribute to fashioning the public wheel and the public interest. Our concern should be with what do we need to do in this 21st century, to move Africa away from being cap in hand and begging for aid, for charity, for handouts. The African continent, when you look at its resources, should be giving monies to other places. We have huge wealth on this continent. In our own country of Ghana, and we need to have a mindset that says, we can do it. Others have done it. We can also do it. And once we have that mindset, we will see it as a liberating factor for ourselves. We keep talking about how it was that Koreans, Malaysians, Singaporeans, who got their independence at the same time as us. We're told of that at the time of Ghanaian independence, per capita Ghanaian income was higher than that of Korea. Today, Korea is part of the first world. So is Malaysia. So is Singapore. What happened? Why have, did they make that transition? And 60 years after independence, we are where we are. Those are the matters that should concern all of us as Africans, as Ghanaians. And not, when I say so, with the greatest of respect to the French president, I think that the cooperation of France is something that I am, as you know, a strong friend of France. I am. Francophile, in the sense. <laughs> so I don't have any difficulty with that. 
but I'm talking about our own propulsion, what we need to do to get our countries to work so that we can create the conditions that would allow our young people to forego this hazardous effort to get to Europe. They're not going there because they want to. They're going there because they don't believe they have any opportunities in our countries. So that should be our focus. And I believe that with that, that if we change that mindset, that mindset of dependence, that mindset which is contingent on aid and charity, we would see that in the decades ahead of us, the full flowering of the African peoples will take place. And that new African personality that was talked about at the time of our independence will become real and imminent in our times. That's what I'm saying. I hope that I'm not uh, upsetting the questioner or even some of my friends who are here. But these are my strongly held beliefs. And that is the reason why I've adopted as the slogan of my presidency, of my period in the Supreme Office of Ghana, that we want to build a Ghana beyond aid, a Ghana which is independent, which is self-sufficient, that is capable of standing on its own feet and building its own life. We can do it if we have the correct mindset to do so. Mr. President, those are my contributions. If you had need to have the proof that a new generation of leaders in Africa croit dans une nouvelle histoire pour l'avenir et la jeunesse, vous venez de la voir. Pour ceux qui pensaient que ça n'était que les mots d'un président français parlant de l'Afrique. Il y a des leaders en Afrique qui veulent une nouvelle relation, qui veulent un avenir pour leur jeunesse dans leur pays, dans leur continent, qui le veulent parce que c'est ce qu'ils veulent écrire. Donc merci pour cela. So, no, we'll, we'll be here forever. We'll be here forever. He has a lot of ideas and a lot of very positive things to say. And as you can see, I have my own things to contribute as well. So um, let, let's bring it to an end. Um, we're going to... Well, if I look at the Ghanaian economy at the moment, you know, it's doing... Uh, I mean, let's just be honest, it's doing terribly. Uh, oh, not terribly. Well, uh, it's do, it's, it's, when, when you... Uh, your, your inflation in your country, inflation in Ghana. I don't know the economy in the world that's doing well. well Tell me Ghana, where you are Ghana, here. Inflation in Ghana. <laughs> the highest well, inflation. Well, 15.7%. Uh, yeah. The, the, the Ghanaian said he has fallen 20% on the dollar. The worst, the worst after Russia, which, is, which has a lot of sanctions began, against it. Began, it. It's began, it's began to, to firm up. It has began to firm up. Uh, we're, we're, we're seeing uh, the, the CD systematically app uh, appreciating against the dollar. People still can't employ, you know, I was just reading today, you know, um, people in the hospitality industry that you're pushing so hard, you know, right. having to lay their staff off. We've got taxi driver unions threatening strikes because of spiraling fuel costs. I mean, it, it doesn't look like a place that I want to go and put my money. Where will you put your money in the world today? Where will you put your money? In Britain? which is suffering the, the, the worst standard of living statistics for over 30 years? Is that where, is that, is it? All right, let's, let's, let's situate ourselves correctly. The world is going through very difficult times. Ghana is no exception. Nigeria is no exception. There's no country in the world that is escaping the ravages of both COVID-19 and also the impact of the nuclear. But we, in what you need to look at are where are the, the, the elements being put on the ground that look beyond the, the COVID and beyond the Russian-Ukraine war. And I think you'll find that in Ghana, the recovery program that we have is one that is, is considered very credible, and it is what is going to give us the opportunity to come out of this period a stronger economy. Mm -hmm. And it is that future that we're looking at when we're attracting people. Let, let's talk about one of the structures that you say you've put in place. Um, the e-levy, a lot of people are calling it a stealth tax on people who already are impoverished. Um, it's a 1.5% it's a tax on people who do business on their mobile phones. So they use their mobile phones to send money or to... The digital economy, the mobile economy. Yes, but you're taxing people on money that has already been taxed. 
is the biggest economy in the is, is becoming emerge, is emerging as the biggest economy in the country, and for a long period has not been has not had any taxation at all. So it is important now that uh, they also come into into the the uh, the, the net. Our country has one of the lowest tax to GDP ratios of any country in West Africa and, uh, and of an equivalent economy. Mm. The ECOWAS area, the general average today, tax to GDP average is about 18%. Ghana, we are 13%. So it isn't as if you're talking about a country which is already overtaxed, if at all, if anything at all, is undertaxed. Okay, let me just let me take you up on that point. You know, on your low tax ratio to GDP, I'm just going to quote, uh, read this quote to you. It's from um, John Kwache, who I'm sure you might know is the director of research at the Accra-based Institute for Economic Affairs. He says there are several loopholes in our tax system that if they are plugged, we'll be able to raise our tax to GDP ratio to something like 20% from the 12% that you're talking about. I mean, are you all, speaking he, to experts like him? First of all, there's a recognition that, I'm, I'm, that the, 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 the... He says that there's no need for the e-levy. Well, that's his point of view. He's an expert. Man is an expert. There are experts in government as well, and we think it's necessary, and that's the reason why we... You think it's necessary to tax people who are already impoverished? They're not already the impoverished. We're, we're talking about people... We're talking about taxing an industry and uh, or, or transactions where the, a lot of value is being created, and we want to also bring that value into government uh, uh, coffers. I think that is something that is very, there's nothing so, and the level, it's not Ghana, it's the only country that has something like a mobile, a, ta well, a digital tax. Many, 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 many companies. countries. They will not like it. Because they're already taxing people who do business online, and then you are taxing as well. People never like taxes. I don't know any, any group of people, especially businesses, when taxes are brought to them that like it. I, I, when, I, when you hear all these stories, Mr. President, I mean, Ghana was one of the rising stars of, you know, uh, um, the economic recovery of Africa, so to speak. You know, but when you hear about all these issues with the economy now, what, what exactly went wrong? I think it's gone wrong. We've, we, we, we're part of those who have been very badly affected by what has gone on in the last two years. Until 2020, since I came into office, 2017, 2018, 2019, the beginning of 2020, we were growing our economy at about 7%, the GDP growth rate. One of the fastest growing economies in the world was the Ghanaian economy, even in the, in the crunch year of 2020, when the economies of the world dived. Ghana, we still manage a positive rate of growth because the fundamentals of our economy are strong. But it has been a difficult task for all the economies of the world. I think it is important that when you're making the kind of provocative statements that you're making, that you situate yourself, you speak as if you're living in the same time as you and I, where the world economy as a whole has, been, has, has gone through very difficult times. And there are several things that we're doing which is in the line of being able to pick up our economy again. I have no doubt that next year, if you were to come and speak to me like you're doing today, we will be, have a different set of facts for us to look at. Exceptional and exemplary individuals across the African continent. What does this recognition mean to you as an African of the year in a time where not only Ghana, but the world is facing unprecedented challenges? Well, first of all, I'm overwhelmed. I have to thank you very much for recognizing the work that we're doing here in Ghana to be able to get this award. It's uh, the name of your magazine. Is, it's a global brand. Everybody knows about it. And for its African version to pick on me, is, uh, it's, it's a big honor for me. I'm very grateful for it. What does it mean? I understand it uh, more than anything else to mean that the world is looking at the work we're doing here in Ghana. It's, it's an inspiration for us and an encouragement for us to continue down the, the path that we've set ourselves. Ghana is now the trade capital of Africa under the AFCFTA. How do, would you want to take advantage of this? I think the question itself in some ways gives the answer. Um, this project, 
building a common market in Africa has been on the table for a very long time and talked about over and over again. But suddenly, the political world to bring it into being has been found on the continent. And that is a very important first step. But look at what it involves. It means we're now talking about the possibility. The rules are still being made as we are going along. But the trading has began. We began trading on the 1st of January within the market. Um, considerable amount of the rules and regulations that need to be put in place to make it function equitably for all the nations of the continent is uh, are now in place. And the implications are enormous. Suddenly, traders, producers, manufacturers, exporters have a market of 1.2 billion people as their target. The project. Congratulations, Mr. President, on being awarded with the Forbes African Person of the Year 2021. Um, we recognize each year exceptional and exemplary individuals across the African continent. What does this recognition mean to you as an African of the Year in a time where not only Ghana, but the world is facing unprecedented challenges? Well, first of all, I'm overwhelmed. I have to thank you very much for recognizing the work that we're doing here in Ghana to be able to get this award. It's uh, the name of your magazine. Is, it's a global brand. Everybody knows about it. And for its African version to pick on me, it's, uh, it's, it's a big honor for me. I'm very grateful for it. What does it mean? I understand it uh, more than anything else to mean that the world is looking at the work we're doing here in Ghana. It's, it's an inspiration for us and an encouragement for us to continue down the, the path that we've set ourselves. Ghana is now the trade capital of Africa under the AFCFTA. How do, would you want to take advantage of this? I think the question itself in some ways gives the answer. Um, this project, building a common market in Africa, has been on the table for a very long time and talked about over and over again. But suddenly, the political world to bring it into being has been found on the continent. And that is a very important first step. But look at what it involves. It means we're now talking about the possibility. The rules are still being made as we are going along. But the trading has begun. We began trading on the 1st of January within the market. Um, considerable amount of the rules and regulations that need to be put in place to make it function equitably for all the nations of the continent is, uh, are now in place. And the implications are enormous. Suddenly, traders, producers, manufacturers, exporters have a market of 1.2 billion people as their target. The projections are that that market is going to grow to a market of 2.5 billion people in 30 years' time, by 2050. So we're talking about a major trading block if it functions effectively. And those who have the opportunity to exploit the possibilities of this market are obviously going to reap big dividends. So what we've been trying to do here in Ghana, apart from struggling to have the Secretariat here, with, with its obvious implications, is also to prepare our business community, our country, its institutions, as well as our business community, to be able to maximize the opportunities that this focus gives us. I think that there are tremendous opportunities in strengthening our manufacturing sector, improving the, the productivity of our agriculture, taking great advantage of the digital revolution to which the fourth industrial revolution that all of us are talking about and which is now uh, a, a, an important driving force in making of policy in Ghana and in implementation of policy. So yes, um, it it's, it's presents an enormous opportunity for us. 16% of the collective GDP 
of the 54 states in Africa is derived from intra-African trade, is the lowest of any regional trading group in the world. You compare it to the European Union, for instance, 27 nations, 75% of their collective GDP is generated from intra-European trading. You take the bloc in, in Asia, ASEAN, which groups, I think, no more than six or seven nations, 56, 7% of the, the, the trading, internal trading of this community accounts for the, the collective GDP. So there is all the advantages, obvious advantages there are in being able to trade with yourselves, unfortunately. Hey, don't start your videos with your name. Partly as a result of colonial, our colonial inheritance, and secondly, absence of policy. We have not been focusing on trading amongst ourselves. Uh, the, fo the, the focus has been on looking outside the continent for trade, investment, etc. But the, the market now exists for us to be able to be, if you like, a little bit more, much more inward looking and uh, insisting that our first priority is how to expand trade with our neighbors, how to expand trade within the continent. And we see that as a very much more secure route to bring in prosperity to the continent. So it's a, it's a major step forward. Well, and I'm particularly happy that Ghana has been honored by her peers to be responsible for the secretariat. It's here. We have a very dynamic young man, this young South African, Wamkele Mene, who's the secretary general, who has uh, come to live here. And they're doing a very good job in, in making sure that the, the AFCFTA comes into full operation as soon as possible. Fortunately, as I said at the beginning, the political leaders on the continent see its value and are taking the decisions that will enable the market to function effectively. So that's where we are. But I'm, I'm very happy about Ghana's association with, 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 with the trade project and the way you described it as the trade capital of Africa. That in itself is, is saying a lot for us. Um, it's that looking inward principle is something that you uh, carry globally. Um, you made a very powerful speech with the French President Macron, uh, where I quote, you said, uh, we can no longer continue to make policy for ourselves in our continent on the basis of whatever support that the Western world can give us. It will not work, it has not worked, and it will not work. Now that speech went viral. Um, why did you take that stance at that time? The timing, well, I'm not quite sure that the timing has much to do with it, much more with the conviction and the analysis mm -hmm. that we made. We've seen ourselves, the post-colonial era, the era of independence, becoming increasingly dependent on foreign donors to support our budget, to support the development of our infrastructure. And it has become something like the... the the central theme in economic management on the continent. It hasn't done a great deal for us in terms of transforming the life of our people and bringing prosperity to the broad masses of the Africa. It hasn't done. And I think the evidence is there for all of us to see. You don't have to, you know, to be that, that, that profound an, an analyst to see it for yourself. So that, what does it do? It, be, it calls for a new paradigm, it calls for a new analysis as how we're going to be able to get out of where we are and move forward. And I think that uh, the first thing, because it's the first part of any development, is the, the intellectual, the mindset, the, uh, the vision that you have, and then how you work that vision. The first thing is for there to be a broad consensus that really that path of depending on French taxpayers or British taxpayers, American taxpayers or Japanese taxpayers are generous enough to give us, will not resolve our problems. That's the first thing. And then secondly, they say the 30% of the world's remaining minerals are on our soil. These percentages for the amounts of arable lands, how much water, all of these 
basic pillars of economic development and growth are found here. They're here in abundance. And if that is the case, shouldn't that be our focus? How can we strengthen our capacity to exploit these directly ourselves uh, as, as a way of addressing the issues of poverty and backwardness that we have, uh, health systems that are not up to it, infrastructures uh, that, that are not up to it. And I think that if you put those two things together, the experience we've had, the potential that we ourselves are sitting on, for me, it justifies the statement I made. Uh, whether it was, uh, it was politic at the time, whether it was the right time to make, the fact that it went viral, as you say, uh, I think indicates that perhaps it was a statement that people had been waiting for for a long time. And it was encouraging to hear it being said by a new generation of African leaders. But I, it, it's, it's a very central feature of how I have been trying to carry out my obligations as president of Ghana, to what extent we can mobilize our own human material and resources to address the issue of development. We are not talking about Ghana turning its back on the world. And I'm calling for Africa to isolate itself from global trade, global the global division of labor, far from it. Um, the statement is clear. They say no man is an island untired of itself. It's as true of nations. We are all interlinked and interlocked. But I think the emphasis, the change of focus, the way in which you look at problems, uh, if you accept the validity of, of the statement that I made uh, to, to, uh, to the French president, it changes a lot of things, and especially the dynamic of how we are going about our development. Uh, 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 I think it's, very, it's a very important step for us. We, in fact, have coined a, a, a phrase out of it. We're talking about Ghana beyond aid as, as the central feature of Ghanaian policy, public policy, not just in the management of our economy, but generally in the way in which Ghana is positioning itself in the world today. And we will, con we will continue down that road because we think that it provides us a much more secure route to prosperity and growth and development and transformation than what we had previously. Indeed. Um, after consecutive years of economic gains that made Ghana one of the fastest growing economies in the world, COVID hit the world and Africa. And you were very fast to respond with a lot of measures to alleviate the effects of the pandemic on the people and the Ghanaian economy. Could you underline those highlights within the Ghana Cares program and what is now needed to bring Ghana back to its full economic potential as a black star of All right, guys, if you drove a Mercedes with a diesel engine between the years 2008 to 2019, you need to check this out. You may be from Africa. Well, first of all, the the need for rapid action. I was in fact in Switzerland uh, on an official visit there and I woke up in the morning, turned on the television to hear the news. And that was the first time that there was this worldwide alarm about what had happened in China, Wuhan. And it struck me immediately when I heard it that we would have to act extremely quickly if this thing wasn't going to be a, uh, what it turned out to be, a pandemic that could have a really uh, devastating impact. Already at the time, we heard statements were being made by some, I think the, the, the woman, Melinda Gates, went on record as saying that uh, we will be dying millions of people in the streets, streets of Africa because of two things. One, there's a lot of contact between China and Ghana. We have a significant population of people who are there, and then we have a lot of our trading community where China is the first source of, 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 of goods and, and services. So the intercourse, people going in and out of China with Ghana, very highly developed. Clearly, if that was the source of the problems, it is something that would 
could could impact us in a very very negative way, in a very seriously negative way, very quickly. So that was how my whole mind. When it took seconds, I was I said, "Oh, this is going to be a big problem for us." So I came back home, and immediately gathered the people around. I've been very fortunate. There's a lot of very capable. Uh, highly experienced people, both doctors, and public health administrators, and then within the larger reach of the government too, came together in a task force that I formed at the very beginning, and then devised a series of measures that, that we put in place to try and find a way of containing the pandemic. By and large, it appears to have worked. It's not been easy. We've had some thousand plus deaths, it's unfortunate, but I think that in relative terms, when you look at these the Ghanaian data vis-a-vis -vis others, both on the continent and outside the continent, uh, ours has been a relatively mild. But in the process, of course, we had all of these disruptions that we all know about: global chains of supply being disrupted. Uh, Escalation in virtually all the uh, the trading ingredients, of freight charges, prices of goods, etc., and it has had a major impact on our economy. And instead of growing at the average of seven percent that we've been growing at from 2017 up to 2020, suddenly a 6.97 percent projection that we had for GDP growth the year of the COVID 2020. We had to scale it down to less than 1% growth. The comforting thing is that um, we managed, unlike many of our neighbors and generally on the continent, to stay out of recession. We didn't go into negative growth even during the pandemic. And I think it's largely because the fundamentals that we had put in place during the period of rapid growth were sufficiently robust. To, in, to withstand uh, all the effects of the pandemic. But it has meant that when you go from, what, 7% to less than 1%, that you see the, the extent of the, of, of, of the impact. And then you see also the nature of the charge that you have to do to get back. The Obantapa program, the Ghana CARES program, has been about trying to reset the economy, mm -hmm. trying to find the resources that are necessary to revive all the key sectors of the economy, and then also to focus on the new, um, not so much projects, but on the new sectors that we want. We want very much to uh, animate our development with the digital revolution. That's the, it's, it's, it's something that is very central to our way of going forward. We want to accelerate the enhancement of agricultural productivity. And above all, we want to hasten industrial development and transformation in our country. And these, the program, the 100 billion Obatampa program that has been put in place is a, a addressing these fundamental concerns. And we see that as the, as the way that we'll have the economy coming back and hopefully in the, in the years ahead of us returning to the high growth rates that we had before the pandemic. It's not going to be easy uh, because we had in the, in the process in order to maintain uh, a certain minimum degree of social and economic security. We had to do a lot of things that in normal times we wouldn't do. Uh, borrowing a lot of money from the central bank, uh, scrapping the fiscal rules so that uh, the deficit in, in our economy became bigger. I think at one stage we got to 11% de deficit. And then having now to rein in all of that and reimposing the discipline that we have to have over our public finances. These have been, uh, these are challenges for us, but they are the challenges that have come out of the COVID. I'm encouraged. I, I believe that the, the, the difficulties that there are, there's a lot of um, energy and there's a lot of talent in this country. The, 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 the Ghanaian people are uh, very resourceful people. 
um, a lot of the Taliban thinks that for them, government rather gets in the way of what they should do rather than complement. But that's that, 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 that's a whole different story. But the energy, the uh, potential for rapid growth once we can give the correct framework and stimulus from from policy is very strong here in Ghana. And uh, more than anything else, that's what I'm counting on, the energy of our people and their determination to try and make a better life for themselves. I would suggest one good way of keeping the energy up is to regularly address us as my fellow Ghanaians. <laughs> because that, you have coined that term. <laughs> it stays with us. <laughs> Please explain to me the vision behind Ghana Beyond Aid and the role of Ghana's youth in this process. I think that um, everything that we're doing, we talk about a population, uh, a people whose population, some 65 to 70% of it are below the age of 35. So it really means that when you're in government, anything that you're doing must address this the, the, this this majority is your principal concern, yeah. Because that's 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 what the people of Ghana are today. Young, yeah, uh, people like me, we are. Uh, You're still young. Oh, really? Yes. That's kind variation. of you. That's <laughs> kind of you. I appreciate that very much. But um, so that's that 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 has to be the main focus of all public policy, and. Uh, the looking at the, the uh, a country which has been sourcing the little development that it can from the outside and repositioning that country to look at its own strengths and energies and there can be no more positive energy that you can have in the population than the energy of young people reflexes, mind, creativity, sense of innovation, all those things. So, yes, the Ghana Beyond Aid uh, has the young people of Ghana at the very center of what we're trying to do, the conditions that we're trying to create to enable them to have a, a sense of uh, hope. Right now at B&Q, get 20% off toilets, basins, baths, shower enclosures and trays. Oh, and there's 20% off tiles too. Shop. Our place, like others on the continent, have been the sources of youth emigration. All of us are familiar with it. We know the horrendous stories there are about people trying to cross the Sahara and get into Europe, and these leaky, rickety boats. We, we in Ghana have not been spared that, 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 that scenario. So to, put a, to create a political, economic, a social project that says that, look, if we work together, look at our resources in a very clear-minded way, our resources, both human and material, we can put them together in such a way that and give hope to all our people that they can make a good life for themselves here in Ghana and be, be part of the, the global community of prosperity and, and a sense of dignity that all of us have to have. I think that that for me is what the Ghana Beyond Aid agenda is all about and it is essentially an agenda about the young people on our continent and our country. Um, on the healthcare side, your aim is to vaccinate 20 million Ghanaians. Do you believe this will be achievable within a difficult African context regarding the vaccine's availability? Well, the vaccines uh, the, recently, in the last months, two months, I think that um, access to them has been growing. I think that by the end of this year, the projections are that we would have received some 15 million vaccines. The 20 million target may not, we may not reach it by the end of the year, but we believe that we, by the, by the end of the first quarter of next year, would have attained it. And the significance of it is that in the population of 30 million people, that's what we are, our latest census that we just conducted has indicated that 
we're able to vaccinate 20 million people. Essentially, we're vaccinating the entire adult population of Ghana. And that in itself builds up all the immunities within the population that we know about. So it's as a target, it's an important target. We believe that we will get, well, systematically, we're getting closer and closer to realizing it. In the process, too, we have taken some long-term decisions. We have been dependent on other people to provide us with vaccines. That's an intolerable situation. A pandemic that is affecting your population, and you are not in a position to assist the population because you are having to beg other people to give you what they have. It's not a situation that we can live with again, if we can do anything about it. I always think that perhaps we should have learned our lessons from the Ebola crisis when we went through it 10 years ago, but we didn't. It was better late than never. But out of this crisis, we have to recognize the need for us to have our own domestic capability to produce the vaccines. So that's one of the very important decisions that we have taken. We're in the process of establishing a National Vaccine Institute, manned by a very, very, very uh, capable, world-class Ghanaian scientist. And uh, we're hoping that by the year's end, the beginning of next year, that institute will also be up and running. And they have various phases of development that they are, they are mapping out that will also give us stronger and stronger capability to find the vaccines for our people. So vaccination, I think that now the science is settled. That has to be the antidote to the pandemic is being vaccinated. I have, I'm sure you have too, and uh, all of us have to be. And uh, now that we are the people who have them, some of them hoarded them, <laughs> uh, are, com are now completing the vaccination of their own people, I think it's opening up the, the space for the lesser endowed like ourselves to have access to the vaccines. But uh, it's, it's something that has to be done. And as I say, in the process, we're trying also to position ourselves in such a way that we're never caught again with our pants down as we were this time around. Um, I mean, that leads right on to the Agenda 111. Um, it's the biggest healthcare investment in the history of Ghana, and it is at the center of your healthcare policy. Will Ghana become the healthcare hub in Africa by also keeping the medical experts in Ghana? That would, be a, that would be a very, very positive outcome. But it's like the establishment of the, of the Vaccine Institute. It is one of the hard lessons that came to us out of the pandemic. Attention, the United States Federal Reserve is having a meeting on July 27th, and a decision is going to be coming out. If you know in advance like we do what will be announced after this meeting, you can potentially turn every $100 into $12,100. You are being invited to watch a free video report where you will be shown exactly what is happening on July 27th and how you can potentially turn every $1 you invest into $121 in 60 days. 60 days from today, you could be making more money than you ever thought possible. You don't have to watch the whole video if you don't want to. You'll get all the details you need to know in the first 10 minutes. Simply click the link on the bottom of your screen now to watch this free video report. On July 27th, right after the Fed meeting, those in the know are going to get rich. If you know what the insiders know, you can get rich too. Now, this event has happened before in the past, and the people who listen to me got returns like this. Mr. Ali Salmi from London, England turned $2,500 into over $280,000 cash in 90 days. Mr. Phil Page from Southern Australia made $15,000 profit in 90 days. Mr. Darcy Higgins from Carrot River, Canada increased his portfolio by over 700% in 14 days. They watched the same exact video report that you're being offered to watch right now. They, however, not only watched the report, they did what I told them to do. 
So watch this video right now so you can learn what will be happening on July 27th and most importantly, what specifically you can do to turn a dollar into $121, to turn $1,000 into $121,000 and the sky's the limit. Click the link below now to watch this free video report. These are Smile Direct Club aligners. They're laser cut for comfort to gently straighten teeth under a dentist's direction. They can turn a smile like this into a smile like this in as little as four to six months. So choose fast. Choose smart. Choose smile. Get started for free at smiledirectclub.co.uk. In the conversation with the vice president, I asked, I wonder whether we have hospitals in every district in Ghana, at the, the very beginning of the pandemic, because we had no idea then of how widespread and extensive the infections were going to be. And obviously, the, the, the basic question you ask was, do you have an infrastructure in place that can uh, assist the population in this crisis. And it turned out that initially, we have some 260 districts in Ghana. It turned out that 88 of them originally didn't have a district hospital at all. So the people living in those, in those areas have to travel long, long distances to have access to any kind of health care. That is not a satisfactory situation. So, it be, originally began with Agenda 88, but then more inquiry, more research established that there are, in fact, there are other areas too that have not been sufficiently addressed and came back and ultimately we agreed on the figure 111 as the number of hospitals that we needed to build and um, felt that having gone through this very difficult time, and seeing the necessity to uh, strengthen our infrastructure. The program, very ambitious program, because we're talking about building these 111 hospitals all at the same time. Uh, it's, it's a major public uh, investment undertaking, but that it was, the, like, as I said, with the vaccines, a necessary step for us to take so that we will be in a much better position to deal with future epidemics. We're told that we are, you and I are living in the generation of pandemics, and it's something that we should now be looking forward to. I don't know whether the word looking forward to is the correct word, but at least anticipating in the, year, in the years down the road. So we then have to prepare ourselves to be in a better position. And in so doing, we will build this stronger health infrastructure and at the same time pay attention to the development of the human capital to manage the skills, the doctors, the paramedics, the specialists, the administrators, all those who work within the public health system. If we can develop the capacity there, it would obviously strengthen uh, the, the way in which people look at Ghana as a source of, we see it in India, we see it in South Africa. To pay. The US, when they borrow money, they're getting it in 1.5, 1.9 interest rate. Africans, when they get the same amount of money, they're paying 9, 10%. The people who don't need a break, they get a break. The ones who need a break, they don't get a break. The sheer survival of the World Bank IMF is based on the fact that African countries and, and many other developing countries do not succeed. Their success is based on our failure. That has to change. And guess who can make that change? We the children of Africa, we, the Africans, 
are the ones who have to say, we know your game now. Enough is enough. We're not playing it anymore. And this is where the diaspora come in. There are more Ghanaian doctors in New York City than in, in the entire country of Ghana. There are more doc Nigerian doctors in LA than in the entire country of Nigeria. So let's be serious here. What Africa needs is capacity, capacity, capacity. And that capacity is in the diaspora. So it behooves us to bring the diaspora together. Let them understand what is really going on in our Africa. Diaspora are not going home. Diaspora are angry about Africa because they are not understanding the root cause of why Africa is where it is today. They think getting rid of a president will take care of the problem. Far from it. That president is just going to be replaced by another one who is going to equally suffer from the same difficult environment to work in. So let's look at an Africa that must be free to take care of herself, an Africa that's free from exploitation from outsiders. The multinationals who are stealing from Africa every day in broad daylight. I use an example of the DRC. If you ever fly very low over the DRC, you'll see tarmacs in the jungle. You'll see 747s flying into DRC, picking up minerals and flying right out. The same multinationals are responsible for arming young people and giving them MK-16s. Because why? Their satellites in the skies are telling them where that village is. There's, there are lots of diamonds. So what do they do? Arm young people, drag them up, and send them to go chop off a few heads. The rest of the village runs away, so they come behind and do their illegal mining. We black people must understand what is really going on. Because what we are shown instead is, oh, look at those Africans killing each other. There are some serious games that have been played in Africa for far too long. And once we understand that, we can strategize as to how we can begin to bring the difference and bring the change that Africa needs. And that change can only come if the African diaspora are united and the Wakanda villages, as I call them. It is our organized way of saying, starting with one African diaspora center of excellence, it will be a new city, a developmental hub that we can then take from there Every sector is developed. Take healthcare. How many doctors do we need in this region to take care of this many people? We pick up education, same thing. We pick up engineering. We pick up electricity. How many megawatts of power do we have in the region? How many do we need? Be it solar, be it wind, be it hydro, be it geothermal, be it nuclear.